you're never doing life alone. And you certainly can't do faith alone. We need each other. And one of our values, you see on our, our code wall out in the narthex as you walk down the stairs, is just that we're in this together. And maybe you're someone who's uh, new to church, maybe new to UPPC, and that's a core value that we believe in, is that we walk in life together, walk in, in faith together. And so I'm so glad you're here this morning. I believe God has something for you, and certainly a challenge for each of us. If you haven't been with us, we've been walking through a series on the book of Acts. And this is following the death and resurrection of Jesus, that the church is finding its new identity, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is being spread throughout the world. So much so that 2,000 years ago, you and I are sitting in a room like this today because of what happened back in that time and back during the first days and weeks and years of the early church. So you're here because of this book. This book of Acts and how the message of Jesus was spread. Now, last week, if you're with us, if you weren't, I really want to encourage you to go back and get on the the UPPC app and listen to the sermon because we talked about a a concept called obscurantism. And it's this idea of the way that Christendom has obscured the gospel of Jesus Christ by focusing on lesser things. It's like talking about my wife's shoes more than I talk about my wife. Okay? Big trouble. That would be obscuring the beauty and majesty and amazing qualities of my wife, right? If all I talked about was her shoes. And yet, the church had found itself over the many centuries obscuring the good news of Jesus Christ by focusing on, on things that were lesser importance. Some things that had meaning, certainly things that had importance, but had lesser importance to the one thing that brings you to relationship with God. And that is the notion of free, unmerited grace. That you don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything to acquire it. God gives it as a gift. All you have to do is receive it. This notion of God forgiving you, forgiving me. So we talked about how the gospel has become obscured. I gave you an assignment. And I love that so many of you engaged in this assignment, which was to ask someone who doesn't know Jesus uh, what their thoughts were on what you had to do to become a Christian. Like, what do we have to do to be saved? I had a lot of email uh, interactions with folks, a few online uh, on Facebook, and a few face-to-face conversations. But one of the things that I loved about those conversations was the kind of energy and excitement that people had, that you can actually have spiritual conversations that don't end in arguing or judging or yelling. That you can actually engage in these kinds of conversations with people, and they're actually pretty rational, and they're pretty open. Last week, I remember this axiom that many of you wrote down. Be a student, not a what? Not a critic. Be a student, not a what? Critic. The world has far too many critics. We have to relearn what it means to be Christians in our day and age and what it means to follow God because the context has changed. Now, uh, I was excited to hear and and receive some of the uh, energy from folks as they engaged in these conversations And it never quite goes the way you want it to. Sometimes you mess up, but you learn. And we're going to look at the passage today in Acts chapter 17 about the way that Paul was learning to engage his context. And I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to Acts chapter 17, verse 22. If you don't have a Bible, I'd love to put one in your hands. Make sure you have a Bible that you can uh, study. This is something that's a conviction of ours at UPC is that we're people of God's word. And in this passage, I'm going to give a little pretext of what's going on, because uh, this is a fascinating story. Probably one of the the most well-known stories in the New Testament canon is this story of Paul at Areopagus. Paul at Areopagus. And he's engaged in his second missionary journey. If you turn your bulletin over, I've actually got a map to help you there. Show a little bit of how the second journey was occurring. Remember, we talked about his first journey was going through uh, parts of Turkey to Cyprus to central Turkey. Now he's going to the far reaches of Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Greece. Greece. If taking the gospel to, to what we know of as Turkey, Asia Minor, if that was new uncharted territory... This is a whole nother world altogether. Athens was the center of classical philosophy and a home of such philosophers as Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. But, but by this point in time, Athens was no longer 
uh, seen as the hub of thinking, Rome was. It had kind of rested on its laurels and was no longer the intellectual capital that it once was. But there were still a lot of smart people there. And just previous to our passage, we see Paul had learned that there were two groups, Stoics and Epicureans. Epicureans were these people who believe uh, in what's called deism. It's this idea that God exists or gods exist. And they, they kind of created the heavens and the earth. They created the idea of human beings. But then God kind of just rolled the dice and walked away. Just spun the clock and, and let creation start doing its thing. And then walked away and isn't involved at all in creation. At all involved in our lives. You have to understand that context. If you understand how Paul is going to frame the gospel. Now, uh, one of my favorite stories is about a, a guy named Lee Strobel who wrote several books. Some of you might be familiar with him. The Case for Christ. Anybody ever read that book? Ever? Yeah, a lot of you. Case for Faith was another book. He was a, a reporter who wanted to essentially disprove Christianity. In the, and in the process of doing so, he became a Christian. He tells a story about how one time he's down in the south, he's uh, south part of the country. He's having breakfast with a friend. And right as they're getting up to leave... He uh, looks at, at the, the couple next to their booth, and it's a, a Latino girl, about 17 or 18 years old. And there's a man sitting across from him about the same age. And she looks directly into his eyes and says, what's a deist? <laughs> He's thinking, I'm an expert on deism. Like, the, the idea of, of deism, like we're talking about here in Acts. And, and he's, he's an apologetic uh, expert. He's, he's, he is born for this moment. It must be a God moment that this person would ask, what's a deist, right? This, this, this young girl. And so he's so excited, he just, he just starts listing off all the things that deism is. Oh, it's like when God just wound up a clock and he created the world and let it go. And, and they believe, uh, deists believe that, that God's kind of impersonal and never really involved in the life of people. But that's not what the evidence shows. He says the evidence shows that God's always been involved. And, and he's, for instance, he's involved in biochemistry and he's all this stuff. And all of a sudden, his friend grabs his arm and pulls him back and he says, Lee, she didn't ask what's a deist. She said, buenos dias. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully some of your conversations this last week didn't end with buenos dias, but, uh, or goodbye, get out of my face. But, uh, but it's an interesting, uh, I think, story, not only of how sometimes when we try to get into spiritual conversations, we make mistakes and we mess up or we have to learn from it. Lee actually goes on to tell a story that, that he ended up encountering that woman later uh, when he was uh, in his travels in that city, and she ended up actually coming to faith by a sheer accident uh, because of that encounter. Buenos dias. <laughs> but, but I love how he even, uh, you know, he, he kind of frames what deism is, which is this, is this understanding these people had that God was impersonal, was not involved at all in creation and in their purpose, their existence. Now, coupled with that, this is just one more contextual piece, and then we'll get into the passage. Uh, Athens was also a city that was wildly dedicated to idol worship, okay? Every street corner had some bronze or gold statue or silver uh, symbol that was to be stopped. You would stop doing what you're doing. You'd worship, or you'd, uh, you'd give offerings to these, basically, these uh, little sanctuaries all over the city. In fact, uh, at that time, it was known to, to have more idols in Athens than any other city of antiquity. Uh, combined. That's how many idols they had uh, in that city. And it's interesting because in uh, verse 16, if you'll just look at verse 16 real quick, he says, uh, actually Luke tells us that he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Greatly distressed. As we know by now, Paul is a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. He has great convictions uh, about the nature of God and Jesus Christ coming into our world so that we could be restored and reclaimed back into relationship with God. And so when he saw these idols, you know, greatly distressed is kind of a one way of putting it. Another way you could, another way you could translate it is he was angry. He was rattled. He was upset. But this is the thing about Paul that I think we can learn from. I bet he didn't just want to picket and protest the idea of idol worship. I bet he wanted to take a few of those idols and smash them to the ground because they were wildly distorting the purpose of human existence. He was mad about it, but he had a choice. And this is the choice that we face. We face the same choice in our day and age. He could either lash out or he could reach out. 
He could either lash out or reach out. He could either attack them for their beliefs or he could win them and attract them to the, the good news of the gospel and who Jesus was, but he couldn't do, do both at the same time. So he decided he'd engage with them. Verse 17 says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. In other words, whomever he encountered, wherever he encountered them, Paul initiated spiritual conversations, just like many of you did this last week. He was initiating those kinds of conversations. So much so that he was invited to the center of all rational exchange, all reason and good thinking, the intellectual elites he was invited to, Areopagus, the great temple where uh, they would uh, judge and, and, and review uh, justice cases in that world, but they'd also argue about, um, uh, about philosophy and life. And so Paul has come to Athens, and now he is exchanging with the elites of that land. And you're going to watch a master at contextualization. Let's read, starting with verse 22. Imagine the scene surrounded by the smartest people in that place, the elites. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. This is what he's saying, friends. First, he's finding common ground. He's saying, you know what? You're religious people. I'm a religious person. We got something we can build on here. We can, we can talk. And he's respectful, even though he disagrees. He's respectful. And he's finding this common ground so that they can talk and deliberate and think about spiritual things and think about Jesus eventually. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Okay, quick time out. Don't get stuck here. This is a direct quote from an Athenian poet, a a, a well-known poet of Athens named Eratus. It'd be like quoting uh, Frost or Bono in our day. Most people have some general sense of of who this is, but he's most definitely changing the meaning because in verse 29, this is what he says. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So this is a brilliant discourse. The starting point is, We're both religious. We have some common ground here. Giving him persuasive reasons for believing that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but in fact was and had returned from the dead. Only a real God could do that. Only a God that was personal and longed to be a part of our lives could do that, Paul is saying. And he obviously knew their stuff. He knew their stories. He knew their movies. He knew their movies. He knew they didn't have movies back then, just so you know. But, uh, but, but he knew their culture. He knew their story. And he wasn't afraid of, of engaging that, but then also pulling out the yearning within those stories for Jesus. The human yearning for Jesus. I, uh, I always cringe when people condemn things that are secular and are unable to see the spiritual in them. Uh, years ago, we were... Uh, 
at a campground uh, with my wife's family, and she has some cousins that uh, we got into a fireside chat about, I'd say an argument uh, at one point, because they were uh, dismayed that me, a Christian man, a Christian minister, would be reading, at the time, Harry Potter. Yep. They, had, they had drawn a fine line. There is, there is only Christian, there is only secular, and they shall not meet. They do not overlap. In fact, they thought that the idea of magic in the story of Harry Potter was demonic and evil. Incapable of seeing the yearning the story actually draws out. Now, many of us are, are Potter fans, I guess. Uh, I hope some of you are. God bless you. Uh, I love the story of Harry Potter. And by the way, I love contextualizing the gospel. Uh, Harry Potter is a beautiful picture of the gospel presented. If you've never watched Harry Potter, I encourage you to do so. The Christ figure in Harry Potter is a beautiful uh, image. There's actually two of them, Snape, who's one. But the other one is Harry Potter himself, the person who must die so all may live, who needed the resurrection stone in order to come back from the dead. These are biblical uh, images that we can draw from, beautiful stuff. And I always cringe when Christians can't see the spiritual and the yearnings in a uh, secular uh, type of endeavors, story and, and image and, uh, and movies, they can't see the spiritual in that the way that Paul's actually encouraging us to do. And that actually, that's a powerful way to contextualize the gospel. So here Paul has done this where he's contextualized it. He's using language they can understand. He's drawing it out. And what's the reaction? How do they react? Verse 32 and verse 34. This is what it says. Look at it. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. We're open. It goes on to say, some of the people became followers of Paul and believed in Jesus. Believed in Jesus. Friends, just as Paul contextualizes the gospel in a way that the Athenians could understand, we too are called to contextualize the gospel in our time. It's something that takes practice, and you can, you can end up making a lot of mistakes, but it's a lot of fun, and you can learn a lot from it. Uh, Dan uh, Gilliland, who's uh, uh, someone I mentioned last week, and I really encourage you, go back and listen to that sermon, because I talk quite a bit about, uh, uh, about this thing called obscurantism. But he, he says this about contextualization. He's written a, quite a bit of, on it, and has since passed away, but, uh, but a well-known uh, professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He says this, presenting the unchanging truths of the gospel within the unique and changing context of our culture and worldviews is a must. He says, while the human condition and the gospel remain the same, people have different worldviews in which, uh, which in turn impact how they interpret themselves and the world and how they interpret the things you as Christians say. Our particular culture that we found ourselves in, which is we are on the forefront of post-Christendom here in the Northwest. We are seeing the tidal wave of change in the western part of our country, but particularly the Northwest. We're seeing it sooner than anybody else is seeing it. Some folks have said, why are you talking about this so much, Aaron? Because it is the dominant contextual issue in our time. Is the move away from Christendom to post-Christendom, and it presents incredible opportunities for the church. But as we are in this uncharted territory that I've talked about, we have to learn, we have to relearn, we have to think differently about how we contextualize the gospel. And this is what we find Paul doing time and time again. You know what we have to learn? Judgment and lashing out will never work. So stop posting stuff to your Facebook page. Honestly, stop doing it. Not going to work. It's a new day. In Christendom, you could have posted every single one of the Planned Parenthood videos, and you would have had applause and rebuke and the whole bit. And however you land on that issue, uh, you know, depending on how, where you land, right or left of that issue, you know, even in Christendom, most people would have generally responded the same way. In our day, you can't do that. It is distasteful. It would be like Paul walking into Arapagus and breakdancing. It wouldn't work. Now, you come into my third grade classroom at Cherrydale Elementary and when I was a kid and you do breakdancing, I'm like, I want Jesus, right? Because in that day, I know it was all about breakdancing. And I, I knew how to contextualize, uh, or I, I would have responded to that contextualization, right? 
In our day, you have to be very careful of judgment and the way that we lash out. One of the downfalls, in fact, of the 20th century uh, Christianity in the 1900s and how Christendom was shaped is it, it, is it led to a very destructive tendency, particularly within one uh, type of Christian movement, the conservative Christian movement. Any recovering Baptists in the room? Yeah. And the problem that these movements... Uh, uh, drew out was that they, and they started to live out, was they were drawing hard and fast lines between secular and Christian aspects of life. Anybody grow up being taught dancing was bad? Right? Anybody being taught that you, you couldn't read certain books or you couldn't engage in certain types of films, even though they were drawing out some of the, some of the most intense and beautiful aspects of human life, but you couldn't do it because there's hard and fast lines. But in Christian and secular. Anybody grow up ever being told they couldn't switch the radio station off of 105.3? Right? And yet we can redeem. My kids, by the way, they, I drive them nuts. But we will listen to, we'll turn it on. And I always say we'll listen to, uh, they like 106. And they, they love listening to that station because um, we don't listen to it. But, but it turns out that when, when we're driving together, I will even turn it on. And I'll just say, okay, we're going to listen to this song. And then I want you, we're going to stop. And I want you to tell me what you think the song is saying. And all my conversations with Luke these days are about, what do you think the yearning is behind that song? Right? Now watch me whip. And I'm like, what's the yearning? I don't know. I, there's no yearning there. It's just, it's a mess. But nay-nay is, it's a demonic word, but no. But I always pull out, what's the yearning? What's the yearning? Because everything, friends, is spiritual. Everything has some spiritual element that we can draw on, but, but we have to be careful this is what we, do, what we have to do. We have to be like Paul. We can either lash out or we can reach out. And I can tell you right now, lashing out is not working. It will not work. By the way, it never worked in your life. Did you come to Jesus because someone lashed out at you? Named the sin in your life? No. In fact, Jesus wouldn't have done that either. He'd say, come to me. I can give you the life everlasting. Colossians 4.5 uh, is really a good word for those of us who, who are Christians ourselves. It says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. You know, the be- best thing you have going for you is your influence. Don't ever cash it out on silly, stupid stuff. Don't ever cash it out. I don't cash it out on Facebook because I don't want to lose my influence later on. Even though there may be something I'm fired up about, I think it's a justice issue or I'm really worked up about it. Not the place. Because I'm going to preserve my influence to reach out in a conversation with someone that knows, hey, you know what, Aaron? He's never going to judge me. That's the kind of thing we have to be wise about. We can either attack people for their beliefs, secular and otherwise, all the idols in our culture, which are like low-hanging fruit, we can grab a hold of those, or we can do what Paul shows us in this setting, is to see the spiritual yearning in these people, to use their stories, and to see the spiritual reality in their lives. And that's the way of respectfully drawing others towards the love of Jesus. It's amazing, friends, what the Holy Spirit can do and what it can lead us towards when we reach out towards people instead of lashing out. We reach out rather than lash out. So how is your Facebook page lately? Is it reaching out or lashing out? How's the time in the car after the dinner party? I catch myself all the time with Jenny. Why why did I feel like I had to critique someone or the way they're living their life instead of just having a, a posture of non-judgment. Now, I'm careful here, and some of you are savvy enough to go, but wait a second, Aaron, and I want to just draw this out just one more moment, especially for some of you who are really really uh, trying hard and trying to understand what it means to contextualize the gospel in our, in our day and age. I want to warn you of the two pitfalls. The first one I've already talked about. If you weren't in church last week, I want you to go back and listen to that sermon on obscurantism. Obscurantism is just, it's just focusing on the shoes and not the person. It's focusing on a piece of furniture in the sanctuary rather than the living presence of God in our midst. Okay? That's a tendency that often many people who've grown up in Christendom get drawn towards. They focus on the non-essentials. And in, when they do that, they miss the essential. They miss Jesus in their midst. They miss the desire of Jesus to give grace to us. Okay? And we're like the older son in that. So on one side, there's obscurantism. I want you to listen to that sermon if you weren't there last week. But on the other side is another pitfall that we must guard against, and it's something I've talked about before called syncretism. Notice uh, here what Paul does, because syncretism is really the mixing of Christianity with something else. 
And it's an attempt to contextualize the gospel, but some Christians uncritically accept the, the kind of religious worldview of secular culture. And when they do that, they believe in it, and then they proclaim it, and then they're watering down the gospel to something that's not even the gospel anymore. And it's happening at a rate that is very, very disturbing. I'm especially going to say if you're under the age of 30, you have to be very guarded about the way that syncretism is occurring in our culture. That you can have Jesus, and Jesus is a good person, but you can also have every other type of religion. Or you can kind of kind of shadow believe in things like Buddha or karma or whatever else, right? And there's this syncretism that's occurring. But what Paul does is beautiful because he doesn't deny the gospel. He doesn't point towards non-essentials. Paul does a masterful job of resisting syncretism. He points towards the story of God and Jesus in everything. And so it makes me think about how are you and me called to proclaim Jesus in the new Areopagus of the Northwest in America in 2016? This is the new Areopagus. You can't come in and do a break dance. You can't lash out. You got to reach out and you got to study and you got to learn about our culture. How do we reach people? How do we have spiritual conversations? How do we learn One of the things that I believe is a call for UPPC, and all year we've been talking about faithfulness to our call, is the call for UPPC to get back to and to emphasize its bread and butter, which is from the very inception of our church, we have always loved, we've always been nuts about kids. About kids. And we need to learn and relearn how to contextualize the gospel to kids in our day and age. We need to learn from experts in our midst. One of the things that I was, uh, I was reminded of yesterday is this undeniable call God has put on UPPC to love kids. Yesterday, we did something that maybe we're aware of. We had a, just a fun fair, and it was a time for people to come and see our children's ministries, uh, see a bit of our school, and uh, have some fun while they're at it. And so we opened the doors for a couple hours, and you'd think, hey, have a few people show up, okay? This is, by the way, what happens when our church opens its posture, towards the city of Tacoma. You want to know how many people showed up? 660 yesterday, just between a two-hour period for a fun fair. A lot of messy people. A lot, of, a lot of folks, just like you and me, who don't have it all together. Maybe struggling through life. Maybe folks who've been through divorce. Maybe folks who are single parents. Maybe people who uh, d- don't know how to parent, right? Just because you are a parent doesn't mean you know how to parent. A lot of people who needed the love of Jesus, just like you and me, need the love of Jesus. And as we open our posture as a church to our city, that the ministry of this place is not for us alone. It is for the the people of our city. It's to open our arms to the city. We're starting to realize more and more the incredible need that there is. Maybe you're here today because you were part of that event yesterday. It's all because Jesus loves you. And that God's sending our church to say, you matter. There's a place here for you. But one of the undeniable ways is that God is calling us as a church is towards kids. Now, I want to do something different at the, for our close of our service. And this is just, uh, I think, really helpful at the last service. I want to uh, always invite us to learn from people who are contextualizing the gospel. Many of you remember Mike Johnson back in uh, late November. But today I want to invite someone who I think is particularly gifted and savvy at contextualizing the gospel in Tacoma right now. And I want to invite, uh, if you can give him a round of applause, I want to invite Bobby Arkills to come up and join us uh, for a few minutes. Yep. There you go. You. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to have Bobby teach us, just to, to learn a little bit from him. And many of you know Bobby uh, Arkills, who uh, runs Youth for Christ. He's the, uh, what's the official title? I want to Executive director. Executive director. So, big honcho. Yes. Right. Huge yeah. title. Tremendous said, opportunity and burden. And yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. Yes. Buenos dias. <laughs> Buenos dias. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all right. Um, but Bobby is someone who's beloved in our church, and you've been a member here a long time, but also beloved in Tacoma. I don't want to make the assumption that everybody knows you or knows a little bit of your story. So could you just give us a quick version of who you are? And, sure. I, yeah. I, I want to acknowledge, too, first of all, that uh, Aaron may be one of the only pastors in Pierce County who did the whip and started to do the nene in the morning service. 
I just think that's... I didn't actually do it. I mean, I, did, I just said it, but okay. I know of yeah. one person here that if I got to get the whip, uh, she would disappear. That's my daughter. Tell yes, me. yes. <laughs> she, well, my kids ran for the door, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we've been here, we've been members for about 16 years, and I joked with Aaron the first service that I'm probably more well-known as Janelle's husband and Kelsey Lauren and Lisa's dad sure. and owner of Kona the dog. But I've been yeah. here for 16 years. And uh, we, we can measure that because we came here when Kelsey was just an infant and have been here all along. So wow. when you talk about the commitment to kids, we benefited a lot from yeah. that because all of our girls have been raised here at UPPC. That's great. And as far as, as Youth for Christ, I've been a part of Youth for Christ for over 33 of my 46 years. Wow. So I was involved in the high school ministry called Campus Life up in Paulsbo, about an hour north. And it was just over 30 years ago that I gave my life to Christ through YC's high school ministry, Campus Life. Fantastic. So it's been 33 years of my life. I've been on staff for 25 years, so a very long time. And I've been here in Tacoma for 15, 13 of those as executive director. Fantastic, fantastic. So we're talking about the gospel. This is something you have a lot of passion about. How do we make this make sense? How do we, in our day and age, how do we make Christianity, how do we make Jesus someone that people can understand and accept? And come to know. And we're talking, you know, as I mentioned, this, this tension between obscuritism and syncretism, you know, I think you're someone that, that has learned how to do that well, among others. But, but tell us what your thoughts on that. And what are, what are your, what are your, what's your thoughts as you think about that tension and that temptation for anybody who's trying to share the gospel in a city like ours? I think one of the benefits of living in the Northwest is that we're very different than the South and the East and the Deep South. So we don't take some things for granted. Yeah. The fact of uh, absolute truth, the fact of people going to church, understanding who Jesus is, we just don't take that for granted here in the Northwest. Yeah. So having done my ministry here all 25 years, I think it's been helpful to understand that in explaining the gospel, you look at Paul, as you brought up today, that he used dazzling rhetoric to connect with the people in Athens. Yeah. And for us today in the Northwest, we can't just use the dazzling rhetoric assuming that people understand what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, actually, I, and I would even say, I think that it's actually a, a turnoff, mm -hmm. is that rhetoric is something that's distrusted as manipulative, but it's something different, you're saying. Right. There's yeah. a place for rhetoric. Sure. Um, it's usually farther along in the relationship of the conversation. Sure. So in Youth for Christ, instead of dazzling rhetoric, what we lead with is relationship. And it doesn't mean it's exclusive or it's away from uh, being able to communicate the truth of the gospel. One of the, the sayings of Youth for Christ has been around for nearly 70 years is anchored to the rock, geared to the times. And that means that our message over 70 years of doing YC has never changed. It's always been the gospel of Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah. But geared to the times means that it looks very different than in 1944, Billy Graham doing a rally at Soldier Field to 1970s to 2016. It's very different today. Yeah. Yeah. But the currency we use is relationship, and we have something we call our YFC DNA, and it's three-story. And what it basically means is that we want to connect kids with our story in the sense that I have a brokenness before God. Sure. With the story of God that may be foreign to them with their own story. So we look at the, at the confluence of those three circles bringing it together. We don't take for granted they understand God's story. Hmm. We don't take for granted that they know that I'm a perfect person because I need to show them that I'm broken too. It may look different than their brokenness. It may be a different degree of brokenness, but I still need Jesus as much. And when we can connect those places together and look for the tie points, the high points of what God's story is and bring it into place when they say, I don't have a dad, I've never had a dad. And I go, well, my dad was distant growing up, but we've got a heavenly father that comes to you and to me and loves us and is always present there. Mm -hmm. So for us, we lead with relationship. Uh, where God opens the doors, whether it's on the very front end of the relationship or a few weeks or a few months in, yeah. then we're able to share, this is who Jesus is in my life, we can be in your life. Mm -hmm. And for some of our kids, that relationship opens the door to meet some very concrete needs. So we may lead with the relationship, but we see that a young person on the hilltop has no place to study and no parents that push them in studying. Sure. So we create a place on the hilltop and in Tilka where they can come in and simply get tutoring. Yeah. What it means to do homework, what it means to actually succeed in classes. We help them to find the skills to go out and get a job or maybe to be able to get along and resolve conflict that doesn't involve punching people or shooting people, yeah. which is a reality yeah. for kids that we work with on the hilltop. Yeah. So we lead with the relationship in the way that Paul would lead with the dazzling rhetoric. Hmm. And I love that you uh, mentioned how God recycles our pain, this idea if, I, if I'm someone who has a history without a dad, that I'm, I actually am well suited then to, to right. provide right. and to step into someone's life. But also, I think you're touching on really what we talk about all the time here, which is that, that the love of Jesus has to be tangible. It, it can't be words alone. It, it has to be something followed up by, by a tangible expression, which is why I love the idea of, 
uh, after school, you know, uh, uh, programming or, or uh, you know, help with tutors, which is fantastic. It's something that a lot of people don't realize they can get involved in. Now, you, you mentioned something to me that really uh, stirs me and uh, disturbs me, but it has to do with a particular need in Tacoma. When we think about contextualizing the gospel in Tacoma and the kind of influence we can have, uh, I think the way you described this new burgeoning ministry as one that we can step in and, and get involved in in some way or another, but it really is heartbreaking. Why don't you share it with us? Right. So it's a ministry that we were, we were aware of in the sense that we knew this was an issue, but we didn't think it was a big issue here. And so one of our ministries is juvenile justice, and we work with kids in Raymond Hall. Yeah. And so the kids are arrested. They come into Raymond Hall. And one of our staff, Brenda Bobak, said, Bobby, 90% of the girls that come in here have been involved in, in human trafficking. When you get three teenage daughters, yeah. you think the average age is 12 to 14 years old. And I say, Brenda, so this is an outlier, right? This is not all the girls. Small are number. Small not number. Limited, yeah. This isn't something that you come across. She said, no, almost every girl we work with in Raymond Hall has either been trafficked, is in trafficking and wants to get out, or is at a very, very high risk of this. Yeah. I think there's somewhere between 300,000 kids that across the country are being trafficked right now. And when I mentioned it to a friend of mine, they said, oh, you mean the trafficking that happens in, in Mexico or overseas in Amsterdam or yeah. in Thailand? And I said, no, it happens right here. In fact, I was talking with Dave May about a month ago. We we're sitting at a soccer game, and I said, this is something we're getting in. And he said, I see that all the time. And he's the Pierce County SWAT team. Hey, and then I talked with somebody officer, else, yeah. Cindy Darlin. Her son works on that unit that works with child abuse victims and child trafficking. And there's a tremendous, not only a burden and a problem here, but it means there's a tremendous opportunity for the body of Christ to do something. Hmm. And so what we did under our juvenile justice ministry is we simply said, Brenda, you have a heart for this. Can we expand your time? We trust God's going to provide the people and the resources, but we can expand your time 15 hours a week. Sure. Brenda's the kind that would go 40 hours a week if we could, but we said, well, sure. let's, let's go here. And what we're good at is we're good at relationships. Yeah. And so we're trying to find mentors, ladies who will walk alongside these girls that are involved in coming out of, at risk of. And I think we realize, too, that this is going to expand across all of our ministries. Kids on the campus that are at risk, that they see this boy that spends a lot of time and and effort and money on them. And it's not always to be their boyfriend. Sometimes it's to use them as an economic way of making money. And so there's a sense of shame that brings these girls in. And what I love about the fact that we can bring people who maybe don't know everything about sex trafficking, that don't know even what to do when you sit across from that girl, but Brenda can coach them. Here are the basic steps to take in getting some concrete needs, getting a place for them to live, help them to go shopping, getting the resources that they can go out and actually finish their education, but also listen to them. And so I think it's something that will grow across our ministries. But I think for me, it was eye-opening to realize that, you know, my girls are 14, two of them 14, one 17-year-old, is that these are the same girls that could be approached by someone, whether on the street or in their own school. And then just like that, they're involved in sex trafficking. And it's the the shame culture that's created. It makes it incredibly hard for these girls, even though all of us would say, well, just get out of it. It makes it incredibly hard for them to leave because they have such a connection with the lifestyle and with the boy that brought them into it that it's hard to break that bond and get out. But I think long-term relationships proclaiming the truth of Jesus that he can set you free is the hope for these girls. And there's everything across the board of long-term housing to prevention, education, and we're taking this slice of mentoring relationships. Trusting there are other people that do the other areas really well that we can partner with. But that's the most important aspect of contextualizing the gospel, right? And, and, and that's where I think that it's not just the, it's the gospel saves, not just in a spiritual sense, but in a very physical uh, sense. I know that. I don't know about you. But does that break your heart? We're not talking about South Seattle. We're talking about as you drive to work this week. These are, this is happening on our streets. This is happening in our neighborhoods. This is happening in our city. And how do we awaken to the need of the gospel to be lived out in our city? And I can't imagine, and I, I, don't know, I said this you know, a couple weeks back around, Another need we have. I can't imagine that there aren't people in our congregation who wouldn't want to uh, explore how they could be a help. I how could they get in? Love it. Say, when I, do I, who do I talk to? Yeah. About? And I, I have to believe that some of you maybe are feeling the, the Holy Spirit's prompting to say, that's something I could participate in. I could be a help. I could be a mentor. I could go and just have an hour conversation every week with a young woman who needs someone who can t- contextualize the gospel relationally. And, uh, and I want to encourage you to follow that prompting. If it breaks your heart, and it breaks God's heart, we know that. 
then follow that prompting and step up. And, and uh, I think if they could talk to you afterwards, that'd be great. That'd be great. Well, so, and I think that kind of dovetails with just in general, this, the tendency we all have, which is, you know what, Bobby, you're really, you're the, you're the, you're the all-star. And so is your staff. But I don't have those kind of gifts. I could never get involved. I don't even know how I would um, serve. What do you say to that? Well, I go back to Mark 3.14. It says that Jesus called the disciples, that they might be with him, that they might go preach the gospel and then cast out demons. So the number one priority was for people to be with him. And it seems like that's... They, kids today are not looking for the flashy, charismatic, yeah. upfront, amazing lead the games. They want somebody who will be there consistently, dependently, and will also be able to be a little bit transparent about their story. Yeah. So if you're somebody that says, I have a story, and I think everybody has a story... And if you say, I can actually sit down and talk with someone about what's going on, I can listen to somebody. We're not looking for all-stars that are able to stand up front and be incredibly engaging and overwhelm people. Because I can tell you that the people that I idolize in YFC are our foster parents, our City Life volunteers, Brenda and her team, Nicole Shower, that say, we'll just sit down with girls. Yeah. And it's nothing flashy, but I'll listen to your story and I'll try to connect what God's doing in my life and what I know the truths of his word and some very practical helps. Because we know that the challenge to all is a challenge to none. We all look at the person next to us and say, well, maybe Neiman's talking to them because the Holy Spirit's loud, but louder, I'm sure, to that person. So um, there are very easy ways. It could be everything from being a mentor or tutor to kids on the hilltop, providing a meal in Tillicum, uh, being a foster parent or helping a foster family coming across uh, next to Chad and Jill and saying, what do you need? Do you need somebody to help babysit? Do you need a meal once a week? Do you need just help, just some encouragement? There's lots of cronky, yeah. concrete ways to get involved. Beautiful. At a very small level, to have that first date with YFC or what God is doing through some kind of a ministry and then see if there's a connection. Yeah. And it may not be a connection through YFC. Yeah, it might lead to something else. Yeah, we absolutely. may say, this isn't a fit here, but here's another ministry that works that could work really well for your gifts. Yeah. What I love, and this is, uh, this is uh, such so true, uh, the way that Jesus worked is that, uh, and it's a conviction we hold actually in our tradition as Presbyterians, which is that God does not call the prepared. He prepares the called. And if you think that you have to get your stuff together or you have to learn how to do uh, contextualization of the gospel before you can actually get in the game, you're wrong. It's actually, it's the opposite. Is get in, try it. Uh, uh, volunteer. Say, I will give a couple hours a week just to say, God, will you use me? And you'd be amazed how God can use each of us to contextualize the gospel. One of the ways that I think that is beautiful that I wanted just to celebrate and mention was that three years ago, we, we uh, as a church, partner with YFC. We believe in you, and we believe in YFC. That needs to be said. Uh, that's why this partnership matters to us. And so many of our members of our church are uh, invested in YFC. But three years ago, uh, we made a commitment to be all in for foster care. Uh, ministry, because we knew this is a phenomenon in Tacoma that is just, there's rampant needs for foster care families and, and the needs of foster kids. And at the time, we didn't have a single foster care family in our church. And today, we have four foster care families at UPPC. That's something to celebrate. Amen? Amen? Yep. Um, obviously, our prayer was, it was that that number would increase. That's a great, that's a call. It's an investment. And it takes, uh, it, it takes a call uh, by the Holy Spirit to do that. But it's, it's encouraging to see the way the Holy Spirit is, is working in our midst and, uh, and helping us to get invested in not only foster care families, but other ways that ministries in Tacoma are occurring like yours. And I want to just encourage you. If you're someone that felt a prompting, don't walk out that door. You know, say yes to it. Say, God, at least I'll ask the next question. Just take the next step and say, Good, God, could you have something here for me that you intend for me? Uh, to uh, to be a part of after the service, Bobby. I think you and, and also some UPPC members who are who uh, are foster care parents or uh, serve at UYFC are going to be available after the service uh, to talk with you. And I'm so glad you joined us. Thank you. Thank Aren't you thankful? Isn't that great? Thank you, Bobby. Stay here for a second. I'm going to pray for you, uh, friends. Will you stand? We're gonna we're gonna pray. And uh, this is something we do at UPPC. If you're not aware, it's a way, kind of a extension of laying on of hands. But will you just reach a hand out, and we're going to pray for Bobby in this ministry, and also pray for ourselves as we seek to contextualize the gospel. Lord, I know you had it planned from the very beginning that we would wear purple today. I don't know what the significance of that is, but, but, uh, but what a gift it is to stand here with Bobby and to affirm this ministry, and also to be open to how your Holy Spirit may be prompting some of us. Lord God, would you provide and would you make way for your Holy Spirit to bring the gospel to 
kids in Tacoma through this ministry. And Lord, I just think about uh, heart-wrenching to think about little girls who just at the beginning of their lives only know uh, their bodies, know themselves as something to be leveraged for someone else. And Lord, that breaks our heart and we long for healing and reconciliation in our city. Help us to be people that don't just talk about reconciliation, but step into it and we live it and we, we help be bearers of good news and we contextualize the gospel through relationships. Jesus, would you bless YFC, bless Bobby, and would you bless us as we seek uh, to live out your gospel in Tacoma. And we pray this in your name and everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother.